So welcome, welcome to webinar two of part two of the winter learning series presented by the Missouri River Bird Observatory, the Missouri Birding Society and the Conservation Federation of Missouri. My name is Dana Ripper. I am with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Also with us tonight is Ethan Duke of MRBO. Our mission is the conservation of birds and their habitats via science, education, and policy advocacy. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce this evening um, a friend and colleague that I have known for almost 20 years now. Seth Gallagher is the program director for Grasslands in the Mountain West with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, he and I first worked together at the Prairie Partners Program at what is now known as Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. It was Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory at the time, um, and that became the stewardship program. And much of Seth's work has dealt with stewardship of our wildlife resources and, and other natural resources. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it right over to Seth and we'll get started. Hey, thanks, Dana. It's great to be with all of uh, my Missouri friends. It's been a while since I've been out there and um, super excited to be asked to uh, present to you all tonight. So I'm um, going to talk about the prairie grouse in North America and um, how to conserve them. So uh, we're going to do kind of a high level introduction of who these critters are and then um, what are some current strategies that are being deployed across the landscape um, to help ensure um, these populations sustain into the future. Uh, and I, hopefully we'll get this done quick enough that we have some time for questions uh, towards the end. And I think you can put those in the chat and, and Dana and Ethan will uh, get to those at the end of the talk. So uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction to myself. We'll uh, talk about what is a prairie grouse as, as sort of defined somewhat arbitrarily for this talk. Uh, and then we'll go through the seven species um, that you know we we're, we're talking about this evening just a really kind of an introduction to the cast of characters um who they are where they live i'm not going to get super super detailed into you know the natural history in regard to things like clutch size and all that this isn't really like a, a researchy type presentation but more of a conversation to introduce you to these species and then really just kind of talk about what kind of issues their populations face across their ranges and then again, what, what some of the solutions are, what those conservation efforts are um, that can help us potentially um, stop some of these declines that are occurring uh, across these populations and really, really stabilize these critters. So uh, I love these birds. They're, it's super fun to be able to talk about them. I've not given this presentation before, so this is a new one. Hopefully it's not too bumpy uh, and uh, the visuals are, and the graphics are all good. Um, I thought long and hard about including uh, some clips for sound so you could hear these because I mean a lot of what makes these birds special is is their uh, mating displays and um, the homework from this from this uh, talk is if you if you really are interested in these birds and you haven't seen them in person um, you know you can go on YouTube or Google and and really just type the species name in and click videos and there's really uh, endless clips out there of, of these birds uh, doing their mating displays. And, and it's really, uh, I thought if I, if I included that, I'd probably go down a rabbit hole and take too much time and probably technically not technically proficient enough to, to make that happen. So um, we're going to skip that tonight, but, but I'd encourage folks to follow up and, and check these birds out uh, some more on their own as we move, as we move away from the presentation. So a quick introduction to myself, as Dana mentioned, we worked together long ago at uh, Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory. Um, uh, I started that job in the early 2000s. It was my first full-time job out of college. Uh, I grew up on the East Coast in New York and Virginia and went to college in North Dakota, Tennessee, and, and Michigan. And, and, you know, one of the best pieces of advice that I got uh, in, throughout that whole education was the first day of my undergraduate education in North Dakota, where our professor said that 99% of wildlife management is human management. And I think a lot of people got into this field because they thought, you know, you'd be with animals and away from people. But the reality is, is that um, much of this work, the majority of this work is interacting with other people, interacting with communities. And, uh, you know, through my college career, um, you know, got to interact with farmers and ranchers in North Dakota. Um, my, um, in Tennessee, we got to, to look a bit at the coal industry and some of the 
uh, reclamation efforts and the reintroduction of elk into southeastern Kentucky. Uh, and then in Michigan, worked with uh, woodland raptors and, and uh, in a landscape where um, commercial logging was still very much active and trying to inform some of those management activities uh, of, of that industry and, and how it could uh, coexist with, with these woodland raptors. And so, you know, all through my education, there was always this uh, human component of how do we coexist with wildlife populations. And that's a big part um, of the grouse story. And, and hopefully we can convey some of that tonight. Uh, as far as my career goes, Dana mentioned, you know, I started at Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory. I was there for uh, a little over a decade. I managed their private lands program where we put um, wildlife biologists in rural um, agricultural communities. And those folks, their, their main goal was to provide technical assistance. So a lot of the strategies we're gonna talk about tonight was the type of work that those folks were helping uh, to implement widespread across the landscape. Uh, after that position, I went over to Pheasants Forever and, a, and a, the Sage Grouse Initiative, which I'm gonna talk quite a bit about tonight to also manage their, their partnerships on the ground uh, with the USDA uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, and then in 2016, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which funded a lot of our activity while we were, Dana and I were both at um, Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory, opened an office in Denver, Colorado, and they needed a person who knew grasslands and, and sagebrush ecosystems. Um, and I've been at that job now, it'll be seven years in May. And that, and that position really is, um, we don't do the work on the ground, but we catalyze these public-private partnerships through bring government funding and private funding into a competitive grant process. So we we manage that grant process, but we also interact with the grantees. And, and a big part of my job is to um, assess where those resources go, but then also follow up with the grantees to make sure that they're implementing the types of projects that they, you know, they said they would during the competitive grant process. So that it's, uh, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have that position. It gives me a 30,000 foot kind of overview of conservation in the Great Plains in the West. And so um, kind of keeping a toe in the delivery of, of a lot of these strategies across the landscape and uh, pretty familiar with kind of where they're going on and, and who the main players are. And I'm not going to really call out specific partners for the risk of forgetting them because there are so many, but there's a tremendous amount of groups like Missouri River Bird Observatory out there um, doing this work every day um, that, that makes conservation go on the ground. Um, and uh, my Peterson was in there just, I, you know, I was kind of a bird nerd from a young age growing up on the East Coast. My mom always had the Peterson guy laying around. And I could just remember thinking, you know, it's hard to believe that there are people uh, who knew every bird in that book. Right. And and um, so it was just a, a, always curious about that and and uh, sort of a love of birds from a, from a very young age. And these grouse are I think you'll see if, if you haven't seen them before in person, um, hopefully this piques your interest a little bit to, to explore these species a little bit more because these birds are super unique and the places in the communities they live are, are pretty special places as well. So what's a prairie grouse? So for the purpose of uh, this talk, we're going to look at seven uh, gallinaceous or chicken like birds. Um, that are lecking species and so what lecking means is what these birds are doing on the screen here on the top. Uh, the greater sage grouse and on the bottom, a lesser prairie chicken. And these are males that are displaying on a lek. And a lek essentially is a spot uh, in the landscape where these birds congregate typically in the spring and the males do this lecking display. And so you can see it's, uh, this is really where it'd be great to have a movie or some sound. Uh, but again, check these out when the presentation's over because they all have their unique um, dances that they do. And so uh, the female then comes to the lek and actually selects the male. And so that's a, a pretty unique mating system for these species. But these leks are really critical to the conservation of these species. Um, they're critical to uh, understanding how many of these species occur, like uh, basically how these, how these species are census for their populations is to go and survey these leks in the spring to understand you know, what the male high male count is on each of these. And, and that gives you a really good proxy for what the overall um, species is doing in, in different parts of the landscape. So uh, from a biological perspective, they're really a, an important measuring stick or indicator. And then even culturally, these are super important. If you've, uh, if you've ever seen some of the Native American uh, chicken dances that, that are, uh, that are, they emulate this uh, this activity, and so there's there's a lot of cultural significance as well to to uh, the prairie grouse. And uh, if you haven't seen it in person, 
uh, definite bucket list uh, to go and and watch these uh, animals do their thing. It's it's pretty awe inspiring. So uh, I'm going to start with the bad news. Uh, kind of maybe the saddest slide of the presentation, so we can just get it out of the way. And uh, I think when conservation um, biologists talk about the extinction crisis or uh, impending extin extinction or uh, endangerment, you know, things like the Endangered Species Act, I think that oftentimes folks not familiar with conservation maybe think it's exaggerated or or uh, hyperbole, you know, that that extinction can occur. But there's two species that I want to start to talk off with, and I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on. Um, they're subspecies of the greater prairie chicken, and one is the heath hen. And the heath hen actually went extinct. Uh, the last bird went extinct in, in the early 1930s. Um, this is a species where they actually knew the last individual, the statue on the um, on the on the presentation here is uh, Martha's Vineyard, where Booming Ben, he was kind of dubbed, was the last uh, heath hen known. And uh, there's this really cool documentary called The Lost Bird Project, another homework assignment to check out. And it's basically this sculptor who, I think it was uh, six or seven different species that have gone extinct in the last couple centuries. He's, he's put up these uh, statues in the last known location of those species. Um, it's a really pretty moving documentary on on uh, you know the biodiversity crisis and the extinction crisis, um, but it's just sad to think that they actually saw this one individual bird, um, you know, by name, uh, Lecking by himself. Booming Ben was the nickname, and in 1931, uh, in the early 30s, they actually banded um, this bird. And, and Alfred O. Gross, a college professor from the Northeast, said that. The last heath hen was splendid, a splendid, well-groomed male, heavy and plump, exceedingly strong and resistant, with no trace of disease or external parasites. And I put that up there just because it's really to drive home the point that um, the individual health of these birds may be quite vigorous, but really the limiting factor in all of, of these populations we're going to talk about tonight is the availability of the habitat for these species to occur. And so while disease and illness are all a part of the equation at times, uh, the main threat really is, is the conversion of the habitat or slight tweaks to the habitat that maybe aren't even noticeable to the human eye that over time really take a toll on these populations. The second species is um, really critically endangered, and that is uh, the Atwater's prairie chicken. It's found in two places on the coastal plain of Texas. Right now, there's under 200 birds. I think I looked up the last population from estimate from 2022, and it was 178 um, birds in the wild. And so this is a bird of the Texas coastal plain. Um, and it's it, this is a direct result of, of that habitat really not existing um, at the scale that it needs to for this, this species to thrive. There's been some other issues with in, invasive ants, fire ants actually, that um, take a toll on, on, on the young chicks for the species. And there's a, a, a pretty um, robust captive breeding effort to actually keep this species alive and, and, and on the landscape. And that's really from a conservation biology perspective, when you start that captive uh, rearing process is, is, is a bit of a last resort. And so um, this slide is, again, not to focus a lot of time on these species individually, but just to say that extinction is real um, and that uh, it's not something that should be ignored um, or, or sort of written off as exaggeration. Um, the species we're going to talk about tonight, I think all optimistically, cautiously optimistic that they have a, a chance to persist if we start paying attention and if we as a society start to prioritize um, care for our wild places and our wild things. So the first bird I want to talk about is the greater prairie chicken. Um, I talked about the heath hen and the atwaters. Those are both subspecies of, of this, this particular bird. Um, there are two what they call pinnated grouse. I don't know if you can see my pointer on the screen, but this okay. displaying bird, the feather that sticks straight up behind its head um, is, is the pinnate feather. And that's uh, the lesser and the greater prairie chicken both have that. And they're, 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 they're referred to as the pinnated grouse. Um, and so this bird... Um, you know, had a, a wide range. You can see on the map there, 
Um, this was the range of the heath end. So basically the Delmarva Peninsula up through the mid-Atlantic states, you know, to, to the coastal plain of southern New England. Texas is cut off of here, but the outwaters is down essentially uh, on the Gulf Coast of Texas. And then um, this is an interesting species because it's actually had a, uh, while it is declining overall, it's had a, uh, a westward expansion to it. And so uh lost my notes here, but I think the last population estimate for greater prairie chicken was uh, between 200 and 400,000 birds uh, globally. And so you can see uh, from the range map there, the, the sort of olive color and the yellow, yellow color is where that, um, where that species persists. Dana and Ethan and I, and I were just talking about Missouri. Um, you know, that's a, this is a species that's just in the last 20 years, uh, it's likely less than 50 birds left in, in Missouri in, in two different locations. And so um, as you move further west, though, in Colorado, you know, one thing we were just talking about when I moved here 20 years ago, these were really a, a species that were found right on the Kansas-Nebraska border with Colorado. And since then, they're actually being seen regularly two or three counties further west. Uh, into the short grass prairie uh, of Colorado. And so as the landscape changes, this bird is sort of adapting and moving with those changes. Uh, but really the stronghold for the species right now is central Kansas uh, and central South Dakota and Nebraska. So the basically the sand hills of Nebraska and then um, a lot of the Sea Conservation Reserve Program and, and uh, the what remaining native prairie there is left in certain parts of Kansas is where is, is really the stronghold uh, for, for this species. Uh, different from a lesser prairie chicken, as the name implies, it's a little larger. Uh, the air sac is uh, more of an orange color. Uh, and you'll see here in a second, the lesser prairie chicken has more of a pink uh, air sac associated with it. And as the name implies, uh, is a smaller creature. I don't get to take a lot of pictures, but I took this picture last year in Nebraska um because I got to play with some cool photo equipment and uh they're super fun birds again if you haven't had the chance to go out and uh be out there before dawn and watch these birds come in and display uh it's 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 a it's a fascinating um routine and and something that it's pretty fortunate to get to get to witness so the lesser prairie chicken this species uh I should mention the greater prairie chicken is does not have a current uh federal status associated with it so there's no um, it's not listed as threatened or endangered. Uh, the lesser prairie chicken, however, just was listed uh, under the Federal Endangered Species Act. So that means the Fish and Wildlife Service um, is now intervening in the management of this species across its range. And as the map shows, there's two sort of what they call um, distinct population segments for DPSs. The southernmost, which straddles the New Mexico-Texas line, is listed as endangered. And this is um, shortgrass prairie and also uh, shinnery uh, oak, which is a low, uh, low growing oak species um, that uh, shin oak prairie is where this, this species is found in, in this region. And then in Southeast Colorado, portions of the panhandle of Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas is the Northern distinct population segment, which is listed as threatened. So the whole species, they, they sort of split it into two geographic uh, clumps, which has different ramifications for how the species is regulated and how the industry uh, or, or uh, development impacts surrounding the species are, are impacted. As you can see, the, the dark orange is the current range. The yellow is the historic range. Right now, the estimate, estimated global population between these two distinct populations of lesser prairie chicken is 32,000 um, 32, birds total. The sharp-tailed grouse, um, this is, we've moved away from the pinnated grouse, right? So that, that feather that sticks up, this is a, uh, you know, not call the prairie chicken. They're all grouse, uh, essentially. But um, the sharp-tailed grouse, as an ornithologist, people always ask, uh, what's your favorite bird? It's a really hard question to answer, but this is, this is pretty close for me. Um, these birds are, are super cool. They're very abundant still. Um, and so uh, you can see that, you know, they've had some range reduction. They were found in, in portions of Ontario, Michigan, and Wisconsin, where they were then eradicated. 
And that easternmost, that very large polygon you see on the map, this is considered the plains sharp tail grouse. And then this westernmost sort of Great Basin uh, population is referred to as the Colombian sharp tail grouse. And while they're not genetically dissimilar enough to be separate species, they do have some morphological differences. The Colombian's a little bit smaller in size, and there's some, some physical characteristics that make it a, a little different. The Colombian sharp tail grouse, as you can see, the range on that species has reduced greatly from, from where it has been historically. And, and we'll, during the conservation section of this, we'll talk a little bit about some of the reasons for that. Uh, but you can see the gray um, being the, the, the previously occupied areas versus the, the really reduced um, current olive, olive green where these birds still occur. Uh, but overall, this is uh, the most abundant of all the species that we'll talk about today. Globally, it's thought that about 600,000 uh, sharp-tailed grouse still exist, um, with, with about 60% of those birds found um, in the lower 48 of the U.S. So um, as you get up into um, the northern Great Plains, this bird is, is fairly common um, and, and a really, um, I think, sort of an indicator species of, of some pretty decent habitat. It's got some flexibility um, to, to adapt to uh, landscape change. Um, which is why it remains abundant, but it has a threshold too when things get uh, go from uh, maybe intact grass to farm ground or other disturbances. It does have a threshold where it moves moves out of that country. We'll talk more about that. Uh, Gunnison and greater sage grouse. Some people might argue that these aren't prairie grouse, and they are probably right. But I really like sage grouse, and I really like the places where sage grouse live. So we put them in here, and they are lacking species, and so. Um, this one has made the news an awful lot in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, you know, in the in the in the 20 teens, this species uh, there was a lot of hubbub about the greater sage grouse, sort of um, maybe being the next spotted owl, right? This this sort of called the, the spotted owl of the West, and and uh, if it, if it were to get listed, there would be a lot of industrial impacts and energy development impacts to that species. Uh, lots of reasons for that, and, and we'll talk more in the conservation section. Um, you can see that the light green is the historic range of this species, uh, and the dark green is the current range. Um, so it, places like Washington State, they're, they're, uh, you know, the populations are not doing great. They've really dwindled to a point um, where it's going to be hard to maintain viability unless some really drastic habitat protection and conservation implementation is delivered. Um, but it's quite healthy in, in, in other parts of, of, uh, of its uh, range. Something like 80% of the birds are found in Nevada, Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana um, are really sort of the primary states for the greater sage grouse. The blue polygon on the southern portion of this map is the range of the Gunnison sage grouse. The Gunnison sage grouse was actually thought to be a greater sage grouse until the year 2000. Um, they did some genetic studies because folks realized that the lecking behavior, so the mating behavior, and some of the morphological features of the bird were different than the greater. And so they actually um, did some genetic studies and determined in the year 2000 that the Gunnison sage grouse was its own separate and distinct species from, uh, from the greater sage grouse. And so you can see again, uh, the dark blue is the current existing range, uh, and the light blue is where the species used to occur. There's about seven little population pockets uh, of the Gunnison sage grouse. This largest one is the Gunnison Basin. So the town of Gunnison, Colorado, and the basin that surrounds it is really the stronghold uh, for, for these animals. About half the population um, of, of Gunnison sage grouse occurs in that one polygon. And then the, these other smaller uh, populations surround it are, are um, lesser lesser in size. From a morphological perspective, the um, Gunnison sage grouse has a more of a contrast in the tail. It's a smaller bird. It's about a third smaller than a greater sage grouse. Uh, it has uh, these contrasting bars on the tail, um, which is a little bit different from uh, uh, sort of the modeled look of the tail of the greater sage grouse. And then these, these feathers on top of the head called phyllo plumes, or kind of looks like a ponytail in the Gunnison sage grouse is uh, much more exaggerated. They're much more prominent. So it's a smaller bird with larger phyllo plumes. 
kind of gives it a, a bit more of a gaudy appearance when it's when the males are lecking. And so you can see this is the male in full display, and then this is a female, you know, often drabber, um, you know, kind of camouflage for for those nesting nesting needs. So that's a quick introduction to uh, to the prairie grouse. And again, you know, I could spend the whole hour just talking about them or showing showing movie clips. But I'd encourage folks if it piques your interest to, to again um, explore some of that on your own. And and if you do have the opportunity um, or the availability to ever get out and actually see these, I can't recommend that uh, opportunity enough. Uh, so as we move into the conservation section of the talk, one thing that's really important is to understand the life cycle of, of these prairie grouse and, and understand what their needs are. And, and oftentimes what limits the population growth or stabilization of these populations is that some point in their life cycle, there's a pinch point or a bottleneck. There's something that's limiting, you know, their survivorship over the winter or their ability to hatch, you know, their eggs from eggs to chicks. Or maybe once they're chicks, maybe there's a survivability issue from the time they're just little guys running around to you know being full full blown adults and so really understanding the life cycle and the needs of these species which are similar right you know um across all of the species they all live in different areas so obviously there are uh you know there's different species that they respond to and there's different localized issues that are concerning to their conservation but by and large these are not migratory species right they do make localized movements so uh, they may move 30 or 40 miles. The largest uh, greater sage grouse migration, for instance, is from Saskatchewan um, to central Montana, about 150 miles that birds moved um, seasonally, right? So uh, in the summer, they were in Saskatchewan for, for sort of breeding, spring, summer for breeding. And then in the winter, they migrated uh, to areas of less snowfall into central Montana. So um, largely resident birds, you know, they're not making these big long distance migrations, but they do move. There are, um, there are perils within those movements, right? Anytime you have fragmentation in the landscape, whether that's roads or fences or those types of issues, um, those types of uh, impacts on the landscape, there's a threat to these species. And when they move, uh, they need, good cover when they're nesting, obviously. Uh, so they need to be well hidden from predators. And this is just isn't a matter of sort of having good cover in the sense of the right mix of vegetation, but also a key element for grouse, for these prairie grouse is scale. The size of the patch where these animals live oftentimes needs to be very, very large. And so if you think about it, if you're a grouse and you're nesting on 160 acres, and there's a coyote den and that coyote has a 160 acre patch to hunt while you're sitting on your nest, the likelihood of being found is pretty high. If you have 1600 acres of habitat that you put your nest in, that's a lot more, there's a dilution factor. There's, there's this, this uh, source sink dynamic that makes it really difficult in some cases for a predator to find your nest while you're in this larger patch of this larger matrix and so for lots of reasons that's just one um large functioning grasslands the larger the better typically for the survivorship and the full needs of the life cycle of these critters um is needed once they nest and they successfully hatch uh they need to feed their chicks and their chicks oftentimes really thrive on insects right and so uh Vegetation other than grass, like forbs, wildflowers, things of that nature, really tend to attract more insects. And so one of the critical things as these, these uh, birds move to adulthood is being able to get them to places where there's lots of uh, insect availability and a combination of cover, right? So they can hide from predators and those sorts of things. So as we talk about some of the conservation needs of these species, it all reflects back to certain places within their life cycle um, where there's a limiting factor. Uh, the top right-hand picture, um, the sage brush uh, for sage grouse needs to be tall enough to stick out through the snow in the winter. These birds, while they're eating insects in the summer and into the fall, when the winter rolls around and it's cold, their diet changes to almost 
sagebrush. And so they need access to sagebrush. They need plants that are tall enough again to be able to, you know, stick out from deep snow. And if they don't have that available, they need to move to where they can find it. So there's all these complexities associated with the full life cycle of these species. And that's really the first thing that you need to kind of start to wrap your head around when you think about the conservation of these species. So the good news, I talked about big is better, right, for grasslands. Um, the good news is, is that in the Great Plains and, and in, the, in the Mountain West, in the Great Basin, um, we still have a pretty good deal of intact functioning grasslands. Um, and so that's the good news. So now we just need to figure out how to maintain that functionality and maintain that intactness. And that's a, that's a big part of the conservation equation. Um, so a recent study out of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln actually looked at on a global scale, what, uh, where are the most intact grasslands around the world? And you can see in North America, these two dark, uh, these two dark polygons, these are areas of 60 to 86% intact grass. And this easternmost polygon in North America is the Sand Hills of Nebraska. And then this Western one is the uh, sagebrush step of uh, Wyoming. And then you can see that uh, the Northern Great Plains and portions of the Central Plains are, um, are also in that 50 to 60% intactness. So globally speaking, we, we still have quite a bit of uh, potential to maintain these species on the landscape if we act now. The bad news is we often hear about the threats uh, to these species as described as death by a thousand cuts. And, and the analogy is such that it's not just one imminent threat. It's oftentimes um, multiple threats in one landscape that have a compounding uh, effect on, on the viability of these, of these species to exist. And so the rest of the talk, I want to kind of just quickly go through what those threats are, but then optimistically, what are we doing as a conservation community to abate uh, some of those threats? And then hopefully we'll have time for some, some Q&A. So the number one threat really uh, is conversion of native grass and native shrubland to some other land use. This isn't to point fingers, uh, but it is to understand where development makes sense, where tillage agriculture makes sense, and to think about our activities in a smart way as we move forward if biodiversity is something that we as a society care about. And so, you know, things like unchecked uh, residential development, um, you know, some of these uh, smaller ranchettes around the West that are cropping up around, you know, just in the last three to four years, this Zoom town um, effect of, of folks wanting to live and in, in a place where they can walk out the door and recreate as uh, some of these Western towns really struggling with the pace and rate of development, exurban development. So, you know, out of the center of town and, and out into these habitats. Tillage agriculture. And again, this isn't to point fingers. I bet everyone on this Zoom call eats food. I eat food. Food comes from somewhere. And so this isn't about, uh, again, pointing fingers, but it is about thinking about where is it smart? Where does it make sense to engage in these activities that we need to sustain human populations, but do it in a way that's also smart for wildlife? And so there's a lot of issues here. And so just keeping grass and shrubland in grass and shrubland is half the battle. And so conserving these areas, then we can talk about management, but if they uh, convert completely to some other land use, then it becomes really difficult and really cost ineffective to turn back the hands of time and sort of get back to where we were. So, so it's a preventative measure of sort of understanding where it's important to keep uh, native ground intact. The solution? There are many tools for long-term protection. One that I'm going to talk about tonight is voluntary conservation easements. And so this is not uh, this is not a government takeover. This isn't um, this isn't sort of buying private land and putting it into public ground. A voluntary conservation easement is simply working with a landowner who is interested in protecting their piece of ground in perpetuity forever. And so essentially, what happens is 
the development rights or the tillage rights of that piece of property are purchased. And so they are that that ground is legally encumbered to no longer be uh, able to convert to those land uses. You can still graze it. You can still ranch on it. All of those things that are compatible to these species can still occur. But it just says, hey, we're never going to we're never going to pave this into a parking lot. Uh, we're, we're never going to till the soil up um, into into row crop agriculture. One really cool example of where this is happening at scale is the Pioneer Mountains of Idaho. Um, this is between Craters of the Moon National Monument and, and the Pioneer Mountains. Uh, folks familiar with this region, if you look at that highway on the on the left hand side of the screen, Ketchum, Sun Valley, um, that's those are ski resorts. And so there's uh, that zoom town phenomenon that that development pressure is really occurring in this landscape. And then the the green is Forest Service, the light brown is BLM, and the blue squares are state, and the white, oh, let's see, the white is private. And so you can see sort of all this interstitial landscape where, if unchecked or unprotected, you know, could really um, develop into something that is less than suitable wildlife habitat. And so in this landscape, 26 landowners have stepped up on 38 different ranches uh, to protect 160,000 acres uh, and they connected 2.4 million acres of public land. And so this has really become a landscape scale place where greater sage grouse occur in numbers that is, is essentially protected in perpetuity. There are other threats. There are things that we'll talk about here in a moment that do threaten this population, but that conversion of land use is not one of them anymore, right? And so just keeping the canvas of native ground is really important. And this is one strategy that's being deployed to do it. Uh, oh, and this is to say that, you know, uh, in the West and the Great Plains, um, livestock grazing is by and large one of the, the dominant uh, sort of economic use of land and has the potential to be uh, extraordinarily compatible with, uh, with wildlife needs. And so uh, pretty unique to uh, conservation problems where sort of the main industry is really compatible. And so that's a that's a positive thing um, for the outlook of a lot of these species is, is the more we know about how to manage both uh, domestic livestock and these wildlife species, we can essentially have our cake and eat it too um, at scale with these species. Uh, the next threat is um, woody encroachment. So this is one, uh, you know, where uh, everyone thinks of trees is a good thing and by and large in most places they are but in grasslands that have uh remained unmanaged or uh fire regimes have been altered um woody encroachment is a tremendous issue both in the great plains and in the inner mountain west the species are different and even in the desert southwest uh, as you're in the great plains eastern red cedar is a tremendously huge green wave moving and i'll show you some maps here in a second of how this species has really moved across the landscape as land management changes in these areas. Uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Juniper in the Intermountain West has a very similar behavior uh, for, in sagegrass country and Gunnison sagegrass country, and then mesquite to some degree in, uh, in the range of the lesser prairie chicken um, has a similar effect as well. And so basically what happens is uh, fire regimes are altered, uh, woody plants, um, once they take hold, it's really difficult to manage back to grass. Um, and there's also the potential for things like catastrophic wildfire. And so you may have, uh, you know, you can see the map here, 1994, uh, barely any uh, trees on this landscape. Some spots where the terrain lent itself to having trees in these coolies and canyons. And then as that seed source expands out, you see this widespread encroachment. And once those trees move in, and you can see this with a with a diagram on the left, this is a, a greater sage grouse that was GPS collared um, in Oregon. And you can see the footprint, you can see the trees on the aerial footprint where they were removed and where they remain. And 80, I think it was 86 to 89% of this individual's time was spent in that landscape that was treeless. They do not like trees. They like having a line of sight. They are called the prairie grouse for a reason. They they want to be in the prairie. They want to be in the grasslands. And so as that system shifts to a more woody savanna type system, 
these species avoid it and they move away. There's science out there that says like one tree per 40 acres could deter greater sage grouse from occurring in a landscape, right? And so um, this is a widespread problem from a land use perspective. If you're a rancher, the pasture in 1994 that you had cows on was far more productive from a grass production standpoint, therefore a beef production standpoint, than it would be in that 2014 diagram because the grass gets shaded out. There's much less forage underneath the canopy of those trees than there is without. So this is, again, is one of those land use practices where uh, the ranching community gets what they want as well as the wildlife community. The solution, oh, well, and here's, here's just to show the uh, magnitude of the threat across the landscape. And so you can see this is some um, remote sensing, so satellite imagery from 2000 and, and then 2018. And you can see that red thunderstorm effect um, is woody encroachment. And so if you look at Kansas and Nebraska, if you really direct your eye to Kansas and Nebraska, you can see a very exaggerated effect just in under 20 years of moving from a, a grassland system to, to a more wooded system where not just grouse, but a tremendous amount of grassland species, songbird species as well, are responding negatively and declining to this as well. So um, huge issue uh, across the range of both uh, the prairie chicken species, uh, as well as Gunnison and greater sage grouse. The solution, uh, implementation of prescribed fire and management of these species. And so uh, the key right now is in landscapes where the trees don't exist, keeping trees out of those landscapes. So not planting shelter belts of, of, of seeding species where, you know, a bird can pick up that seed and go disperse it out to the middle of a pasture. That's where we're really seeing big issues where shelter belts were put in place, um, well-intended, you know, uh, shelter for livestock, uh, you know, important agricultural use, but we're now seeing um, some really dire unintended consequences of that practice. So at scale, what's happening is uh, the mastication and the hand removal of these trees. And again, this is both, this is both across sage grouse and greater prairie chicken range. Um, so uh, I won't go too heavy into the practices, but it involves everything from hand crews to heavy machinery um, to actually uh, eliminate the, um, the encroachment issue. And then it's followed up typically by prescribed fire to ensure that, you know, we, in 10 years, we're not back to where we were and, and the expense associated with eliminating those trees on the landscape um, comes back. Uh, this is just, you can see, this is in, in greater sage grouse country. I think this is in Oregon. Um, no, this is uh, Southwest Montana, Beaver Red County, Montana. Um, you can see Rocky Mountain Juniper and some Douglas fir on the top. Um, and and uh, this is known sage grouse area where they have animals marked and they can start to see avoidance of areas where this encroachment and infestation occurs. And then they've gone in uh, and uh, after restoration, um, you can see what that looks like. This is kind of a cool story. This was actually some of this stuff was done during COVID, where the outdoor industry in the in Beaverhead County took a big hit. People weren't going on fly fishing trips. People didn't need hunting guides, and so some of the conservation partners in that region had the great idea to train up some of the folks in the outdoor industry as Sawyer crews. And so they basically put folks to work um, during COVID with the ultimate social distancing. Um, putting folks out in the field with the chainsaw and, and having them get after it. So creative ways to um, come up with conservation solutions. This one's huge. Annual invasive grasses. Uh, so cheatgrass is a non-native grass. It's very shallow rooted and it's an annual. And so what that means is, uh, you know, you can think of a perennial grass like a tree. You know, it comes back, it's alive every year. It may it may have its leaves grazed off, but every spring it grows back and it has a deep root. An annual grass uh, is the opposite of that. It's shallow rooted and the, the leaf itself sprouts a seed and then the, the plant itself dies. But that seed then falls into the seed bank, sprouts, and you have a whole new crop of new plants in the second year. Uh, this is a very volatile, fine fuel. And so as this 
species gets a foothold, particularly in the Great Basin and places like the Snake River Plain in Idaho and uh, the Great Basin of Nevada, it changes the fire regime because of the fine fuel load. It's very volatile. It catches fire. It oftentimes burns the native vegetation with it. And then you get into this burn cycle of instead of burning every 50 years, like sagebrush may have done historically, it starts to burn every year or every other year. And sagebrush, the shrubs, the forbs, the perennials that are important for these species from a nesting and brood rearing perspective, don't have the ability to catch a, catch a foothold. And you get this monoculture of just annual grasses in that burn cycle. And we're seeing this happen, unfortunately, at scales of hundred thousands of acres in one burn. You look at some of the fires um, in the last 15 years in Nevada, some of them 150, 300,000 acres in scale of just sagebrush step that's been burnt, you know, in, in the course of a couple of days and converted to this annual invasive grass. And so this one is a challenge. It's a big challenge. This species does occur in the Great Plains. It's not been as widespread as it has in the Great Basin and points further west. But as the climate starts to change, that may that may be it may become an issue more widespread than it already is. And so half the battle with this is understanding where the potential for this threat to take off is and understanding how to protect those areas. And so this is a resiliency map that shows the red again, this thunderstorm. Here's the Snake River Plain. You can see where a lot of this is already converted to cheatgrass places in the Great Basin in northern Nevada. Uh, and then versus these other sort of cooler spots on the map where the conservation activity is really to prevent cheatgrass from getting a, a foothold in those areas. Lots of different ways they're doing that. Um, fire prevention is a big one. So, you know, thinking about things from fire breaks, having communities ready to respond to range fires rapidly, that's half of the battle, right? So having community fire associations where um, rather than waiting for a, a three hour response from a federal land management agency, there are folks that live in that community that can respond faster. Um, that's part of the equation. Restoration activities, there's some chemicals that are super promising that um, only go into the top horizon of the soil. And so they prevent these shallow uh, rooted annual grasses from germinating, but the deep rooted shrubs and grasses are not impacted by those chemicals. And so there's some chemical treatments that are showing some really great prog promise um, in the region. And then there is some grazing that you can do. So like if you if you graze this species early enough, in the spring while it's still green uh, because it is an annual if you you know if you get after it really hard and you really knock the numbers back there is some ability from a grazing perspective to actually um, keep this issue at check degraded wetlands uh so we talked about the importance of those chicks being able to find insects you know a lot of these Birds are adapted to not having a tremendous amount of water on the landscape. They get a lot of what they need from a water perspective through their diet, but they need bugs and bugs need forbs. And in order for there to be a good forb component, wildflowers and things of that nature, you need to have moist soil. And so as these riparian areas and these wet meadows over time um, were sort of ignored and not managed, uh, erosion has occurred and the water tables really dropped in these areas. And so one of the solutions that's current continually occurring is how do we make, how do we make these green spots on the landscape larger? And, you know, there's some literature out there about riparian areas talks about how these spots in the Western U S are less than 1% of the overall makeup of the landscape, yet they're critically important to 80% of the species out there on the land. And so a really, uh, closer eye has been attuned to thinking about ways to restore these areas, not just from a water perspective, but from a water table, moist soil perspective, and the and the ensuing habitat and plants that, that result in it. Some of the solutions to that, oh, and uh, in addition to sort of lack of management, there was this critter that was widespread pre-settlement, that's the beaver, and, uh, you know, the landscape looked completely different in regard to where water was in the landscape, how long that water persisted. And, you know, there was more resiliency to things like drought because that water table was more saturated when we had um, that ecological engineering from the beaver, right? So some of the solutions for this are beaver mimicry. So actually not necessarily reintroducing beavers, but having crews go out 
and build structures that resemble beaver dams. And then also this process called Z-Dike restoration. This is Bill Z-Dike. He's a retired Forest Service hydrologist from New Mexico who has sort of um, revolutionized this half art, half science of, of uh, kind of process-based restoration, they call it, where they can go in with masonry and hand crews and pile rocks or other natural vegetate or natural materials to uh, catch silt. Once that silt catches in those flood events, it increases the water table and really heals up some of the erosion that was occurring in that in that cutting uh, and uh, desert of desertification of some of these areas um, over time. So we're seeing these practices be widely adopted across the West. Super exciting. Just in the last ten years, this is really sort of caught fire um, and really being replicated at scale. Getting close to the end here, uh, anytime you put anything on the landscape, it has a ramification, whether it's a road or a fence. Um, and I wanted to take a minute to talk about not just birds, but, um, you know, some of our larger uh, wildlife species as well have conflicts with fence on the landscape. And so um, thinking about ways to abate these threats, uh, you know, there's some debate among the scientific community about how significant this threat is to the prairie grouse. Uh, there was a study that came out of Oklahoma that showed 40% mortality on lesser prairie chickens due to fence collisions. There's other folks that don't think it's that big of a deal in certain areas. The reality is probably somewhere in the middle, and that is, is that fences in certain spots are probably going to have higher impacts than, than other fences. And so if you think about things like the topography of the landscape and the proximity to their lacks. So like when a golden eagle flies over and these things flush and they sort of have like that panic flight response, if there are fences close by, sometimes those fences have um, sort of a higher rate of impact than a fence that's maybe further away from a lack. And so there's some strategies that are being deployed, things like fence removal and whatnot, but really trying to target where we know there are problem fences um, across the landscape to really tactically address this issue, not um, necessarily at scale, but, but really being smart about it. So some of the things that they're doing, uh, crazy low tech and crazy high tech. So a really low tech uh, methodology is marking fences, just making them more visible. And so, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, folks were just buying, um, vinyl siding and actually cutting it up into three inch strips on a chop saw. And then they'd get out and, and hang it on fence and that made fences more visible. There's actually commercial products now available for that as well. Super high tech solutions. And this is not just for fence collision issues, but for land management in general, oops, uh, virtual fence. So if you think about a pet fence for your dog in the front yard and visible fence technology, that technology is now advancing to livestock management. So landowners actually have the ability from a tablet or a laptop to draw a polygon of where they want their livestock, when they want them there and when they don't, and training them to a system that stimulates them versus actual physical fence in the landscape. I could do a whole hour talk on the potential of that technology alone in regard to wildlife. The potential is endless, but it's super exciting and something that we're seeing um, become pretty popular with, with producers. And then um, ways to, 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 to navigate some of these tricky areas, whether it's a railroad track or a highway, this is a uh, pronghorn overpass in Pinedale, Wyoming. Um, and so giving these animals the ability to move across some of these man-made features uh, in a less detrimental way. Almost out of time. Uh, in conclusion, you know, I am uh, cautiously optimistic that we can conserve these species, at least sustain the numbers of these species we have if we act now, if this becomes a priority for us um, from a society's perspective. It's going to take a lot of people. It's not just biologists who care about it. It's not just bird lovers who care about it. It's trying to think about how um, we can have industry in these regions. The man holding the pin there is Dwayne Coombs. He's a Nevada rancher who um, is, a, is a big proponent of sage grouse conservation. But he sees that, you know, there's a saying in the sage grouse community, what's good for the bird is good for the herd. Um, and so 
really finding these win-win situations where we can um, have thriving rural economic communities and, and wildlife is really going to be, um, I think, the way forward um, for all of these prairie graphs. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, and Dana and Ethan, I really appreciate the invite to, to talk and uh, hopefully we have time for a couple questions. Thank you, Seth. Um, that's totally up to you. We do have some questions. If you're willing to hang out with us a bit and take some questions, sure. that would be awesome. Um, I have a quick question myself. I realize that this is an incredibly complex situation. Um, so I'm not sitting here asking you to you know, comment on all of it, but we here in Missouri often see um, you know, cattle operations that are really, really overgrazed, right, to golf course level. So when you say that, you know, wildlife management and grazing can be like a, a sustainable interaction that benefits both, can you just sort of highlight a couple of like really positive, good best practices for grazing management for us? Yeah, well, I'll start by one, you know, I think there was in the early years of the, some of the sage grouse initiative work, you know, there were some grazing prescriptions uh, put on the landscape um, early on that over time um, they looked at sort of bird response to. And for sage grouse, uh, you know, over a four or five year period, I think the folks who were implementing the prescriptions were surprised to find that really there was no difference in the density of sage grouse on areas that were sort of rotationally grazed versus areas that were continuously grazed. There was really no magic to it. What, what, what was more important was the intactness, right? And so um, that's, that would be the first point is that um, if you think of, if you think of intact rangelands as, um, if you think of intact, my dogs are hungry. Um, if you think of intact rangelands as a blank canvas, that's where we need to start. And then you can tweak management accordingly, right? And so um, I think that's the, that's the first piece of this. The second piece is from a, from a producer perspective, I think the folks who um, are really adopting this at scale are the folks who have seen change on their places over time. And the, the strategies that are being deployed from a grazing perspective, and even some of that riparian work that we talked about, um, build climate resiliency, right? So they build resiliency into years when you're super dry or years when you're super wet or whatever it is. Um, when you have more flexibility in your operation, then you're sort of not always operating in crisis mode. You have an even keel. You're not selling livestock and those sorts of things. So people are really thinking, at least in our part of the country, thinking less about how to drive their systems harder to produce more livestock and they're trying to think more about like, what do I need to be economically viable? And then how do I manage that at a sustainable rate so that when I do, when, when the climate does throw these curveballs, we, you know, we're not going out of business as a result. Thanks. I uh, just sort of stole the questions there for a second, but to get to some of the questions that are in the Q&A, um, Jack asks, is the reason that most grouse species did not historically live in Missouri, the difference between short grass versus tall grass prairie habitat? Great question. Yeah. So, um, you know, the greater prairie chicken, I think, uh, is a good example of a species, you know, that um, is, is more of a tall grass adapted species. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. And as you see that gradient, greater prairie chicken is a great example. If you looked at that map of where that species occurred, where it does now moving westward, um, you know, some of the grass where that animal thrives is, you know, and again, this is probably a whole nother talk, but conservation reserve program or CRP, which is essentially a piece of retired farm ground that a producer is paid a rental fee to not farm and to put back into native ve native vegetation. Oftentimes that native vegetation, the further west you get, it's warm season grasses that are kind of tall, tall grass species like little blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass that aren't necessarily native to places like Eastern Colorado at scale, right? That's sort of Buffalo Blue Brahma country. But as we see CRP mixes sort of more towards that tall grass spectrum, you see that species sort of shift with it. And so, yeah, I, the the um, 
the structure of the vegetation has it has everything to do with it and and as there's no you know as there's very you know i think dane and ethan were telling me there's sixty thousand acres of native prairie left in missouri um you know that's again the if you don't have the canvas you can't you can't even determine whether you know it's short grass or tall grass it's no grass right so Let's see. Uh, cool natural history question. Are lecking sites reused annually or are new sites made each season? Great question. They are reused every year, typically. They're, uh, depending on sort of numbers of critters, there'll be sometimes satellite populations or satellite leks that pop up. So in other words, like if a lek gets so dense that, you know, it's a little crowded, there may be one that pops up over the hill. But by and large, like the, the level of uh, fidelity to those sites is 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 pretty high and that's actually one of the things that is a threat to them so like if you put a road through a lek you know there there are spots in wyoming where you could go to and i could take it to birds that are lacking right on a sort of a, you know a dirt road in blm right um that gets oil traffic um and so uh dana i don't know if you remember when we were working in southeast colorado there was a bird that was found um at a rest area near Eads, Colorado, and all the USDA guys were giving us a hard time, like, should we add paving a parking lot to the practices for lesser, you know, so um, they do weird things at times, but yes, the answer is they go, they go back to the same spots typically, um, and, and that can be good and bad. I mean, it can be good that we know where to target our conservation efforts, but if those, if, if fragmentation or disturbance happens within proximity to those leks, there's not a lot that's going to stop them from going back to that spot. Um, so here's, the, I think this is a good question to address some of the things that you were talking about regarding trees and tree encroachment, um, which is very important here in Missouri as well. Um, but what other tree species can be used for wind breaks? Yeah, good question. I think they're starting to look at, you know, some of the same species, but just thinking about the gender of the tree in regard to like the seed production. And so like trying to think about, you know, basically like planting sterile, um, you know, sterile variants of, of different tree species so that you don't have this seeding issue. I think it's really kind of where things are going. Um, but Eastern, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm, uh, there's a bumper sticker that says trees are the answer, you know. And I always wanted one that kind of said, you know, like, what's the question, right? And so I don't know what the what the right answer is for shelter belts. I mean, there's there's still obviously an ecological and economic need to maintain that practice. Um, but I can tell you the trouble species right now, particularly is eastern red cedar and Rocky Mountain juniper in the West. I mean, those are the two sort of on the most wanted list, if you will. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, local extension services and whatnot I hope are getting savvy to, you know, putting in wind breaks that are, are, um, you know, don't expand. Grass is the answer in Forbes. Um, has there been an effort to have the greater sage grouse listed as an endangered species under the ESA? Asks Gary. Yes, and that's kind of this the last slide. I didn't really have time to get into it, um, but this this last slide is actually um, that stage is the former Secretary of Interior Sal Sally Jewell um, with the Director of the Fish and Wildlife Service and a number of governors on stage there um, from from the primary sage grouse states: Colorado, Wyoming, um, Montana. Um, that 2015, uh, the decision was made not to list the um, greater sage grouse is endangered. And a lot of that was due to the effort of all of those things that I just talked about being deployed widespread uh, across the region. Declines are still occurring. Um, you know, the, we, the, 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 the population has not stabilized. It may be revisited. Um, I did want to talk, I think I talked a little bit about, you know, Gunnison sage grouse is listed. It's a threatened species under the ESA. There's only about 4,000 of those birds total right now. Um, and then lesser prairie chicken is split, listed, threatened, and endangered. And then Atwaters obviously is quite is critically endangered. Um, so those are the those are the three species right now that have legal protection under the Endangered Species Act. Greater sage grouse does not currently have that.
Just a couple more if you're okay with it, Seth. Yeah. Um, and I do want to note, Jackie asked in the chat, what is the best time of year location to have the best opportunity to view these birds in the wild? I think what we're gonna try and do is um, when we send all of the registrants to this webinar, a follow-up email um, with some of the stuff that you have said, Seth, we'll um, do a little searching and put a few suggestions in there, um, like links for folks to be able yeah. to find opportunities. Yeah, that would be great. Some of these, you know, there's some, um, I would really encourage, uh, you know, one of the things about keeping uh, this species on the landscape is if we can make it economically viable for communities to do it. So you can DIY this, you can maybe find one on eBird uh, and, and go park your car and, and do it yourself kind of thing somewhere. And that's great. But if you really want a great experience, there are a, a number of sort of private tour operations that um, you know, ranchers are are operating where they charge a fee, and you go out and you sit in a blind, and and those honestly those experiences tend to be, you know, of of, of higher quality. You can you uh, that picture that I mentioned I took last year, you know, you're like right on top of these birds in a way that's ethical. They you know they basically have the blind out there all season. The birds get acclimated to the activity and the and the blind being there, and you know obviously. Uh, ethical birding standards apply and, and you don't want to be disturbing these birds while they're lacking. And so going out with some of these professional operations or commercial operations, I think is a really, if you want to do something for grouse conservation, um, I think it, it's, it's a viable sort of way to, um, you know, open your checkbook, support these rural communities, uh, view in an ethical way, but also let folks know uh, in those communities that these species are important to you. Awesome point. Thank you. Um, Dan Gatman, thank you for asking this question. I would like to know the answer too. How widespread is the presence of wind farms on prairies and how high is their impact on birds, not just prairie grouse? Yeah, great question. Um, boy, I I it's widespread. I mean, I don't I don't have an answer. I don't have any stats for you. I can tell you that there's landscapes that you know, you used to be able to drive across 20 years ago. Pawnee National Grasslands is a great example. Um, some of the last remaining uh, plain sharp-tailed grouse habitat in Colorado um, is is pretty well dotted with with uh, you know with wind turbines now. And I don't know what the impact has been to, to prairie grouse. There's obviously there's clearly issues with um, raptors at times, um, and you know direct mortality associated with that. There's been some there's been kind of mixed results on some of the studies that. You know, I think there's been some greater prairie chicken stuff come out of Kansas where they expected some avoidance and didn't quite see it as strongly as they expected they would, given sort of the, the addition of that vertical structure. Uh, but it's all about placement, you know, and thinking about thinking about these areas where um, the landscape is dominated by tillage. To me, that's where we need to be thinking about targeting uh, some of those practices in these areas where we have intact grass. Um, you know, and really trying to target some of that energy development away from those intact areas. Again, it's all about siting and grouping these things. Um, so I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but there there are anytime, right? Like the final slide of roads and fences, anytime you put some sort of man-made activity, there's impacts, right? Um, there's just there's just no avoiding that. And I think sometimes green energy, right? We don't we don't think about that. It's easy to point to sort of the older energy sources as dirtier or whatever, but we don't necessarily think sometimes about these these uh, um, you know supposedly sustainable or green energy initiatives and what impacts they do have because they're, they're you know there's there's always impacts. Thanks. And to follow up with that, um, there is a document for energy siting guidelines in Missouri, um, and that will be added to the follow-up email as well. It includes solar as well as wind um, and has just been produced by a number of conservation organizations and is a very useful document. I had one more slide that I forgot, and I just wanted to real quick before people drop off, just acknowledge that I got a lot of resources today from the maps I, I borrowed from the North American Grouse Partnership, um, the NR USDA Natural Resources Conservation Services Working Lands for Wildlife. If you have any interest in the habitat type stuff that I talked about tonight, they have a tremendous amount of resources on their webpage 
one, you know, two page fact sheets about how to do some of this work, where this work's occurring, um, you know, just endless, endless information, uh, more than a decade's worth of things on, on that website. So if you're interested in the technical end of it, I would advise you to go there. And then I did steal some pictures tonight and would plug my buddy and Missourian. Is it Missourian? Is that, or is that what you are? Are you a Missourian? Anyway. Missourian. <laughs> Missourian. Um, not at all. Pao Thong, who is a photographer from Missouri, has these two incredible coffee table books that tell the story of, of grouse and the imagery is like, it's second to none. The stuff's amazing. And um, so I used some of his uh, pictures tonight, but if, uh, if you don't, if you don't have the ability to get out and actually see these things in person, um, you know, nothing quite does that justice, but these books come darn close. So. Michael Meredith wrote in the chat, Nop rocks. Nop That's does definitely rock. true. <laughs> All right, I see some thank yous and great presentations in the chat there, Seth. Um, I don't see any further questions, so we will go ahead and let folks go. Thank you so much, our friends, for doing this. Great to see you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Night, everybody.